Usually it is. No, it wasn't last time. Oh, okay. Let's notice that you can see the whole slide. And that's the pan in case that one runs out. It won't. All right, we are live on Facebook and recording the class. So I'm going to let these other people into the room and you can go ahead and take it away anytime. All right, thank you, Gina. <clears throat> 50 years ago, this month was the first time a human set foot on a different orb than Earth. And I think we all saw what happened yesterday with, Cal, uh, with uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon, now called Endeavor, with uh, Doug and Bob. So there's a blast off from uh, yesterday, Falcon 9, two-stage rocket with the um, Dragon on top. There it is going higher. And there you can see the Dragon on top, the uh, two crew uh, tip. There are the heroes of the day, uh, although obviously there are tens of thousands of people behind them helping, engineers, scientists, all kinds of folks. And that's uh, Bob and Doug. And here they are uh, reclining, uh, not taking it easy, but reclining in uh, the Dragon space capsule. Now, in this presentation, I'm going to intermix, intercalate science fiction with science. So you'll have to pay attention on my top of my slide, whether it says fiction or real. So some are going to be real, R-E-A-L, and some will be fiction, R-E-E-L. So we're going to switch back from real to real ever so often. There is the uh, ISS, the International Space uh, Ship, that uh, carries a three to seven person crew. And it's had 15 different uh, countries represented uh, on it. Uh, it's a consortium of a number of uh, various groups, including, of course, NASA slash USA. I put the pointer on where the uh, Dragon uh, crew will merge. And here you can see it in the process of getting ready. It took me a while to take this picture out there. So do you wanna take a trip? There's perhaps no topic that has inspired science fiction quite as much as science exploration, or as said in Star Trek, the final frontier. So I'm gonna show you a bunch of uh, spaceships from fiction, from the movies, TV, books, et cetera. Here is Hermes, that's a pretty common name for these things, from The Martian by Weir, and it's a really terrific, realistic. 2001, A Space Odyssey by Stanley Kubrick, uh, Kubrick and uh, Arthur C. Clarke, uh, shows this uh, great uh, ship. And there was their ship where they headed toward uh, Saturn. Elysium shows a big space station with tons of people on it. And of course, there is Star Trek going where no one has gone before. And that's obviously been a major franchise. Millennium Falcon, 
close encounters of the third kind. Flying saucers, interestingly, that, that term wasn't used until 1947 and uh, has been used since then. Uh, it wasn't originally used as a flying saucer, but the Air Force captain pilot that saw it said it kind of reminded him of a saucer used with a cup and saucer. And of course, here's Battlestar Galactica in which 40,000 plus uh, humans uh, travel to distant worlds trying to find a home. Project Nine from South uh, Africa is a terrific movie as well. And of course, one of the latest is Arrival, which brings up the question of how are we going to communicate with aliens and how are they going to communicate with us? We can't even communicate with other life forms on this planet that have been subject to the same evolutionary pressures, if you will. He who gazes at the stars unavoidably starts thinking. So it may be the heavens that really stimulated our brains. Now here's a very brief timeline of science fiction ideas of space travel. And as you can see on the top here, it started very, very early, must be ingrained in our brains for some reason, in the second century BC, when Lucian of Samosata described voyages to the sun and the moon. Now he was really spoofing Greek romances, but uh, he called it a true story. Cyrano de Bergerac, as you see down here, described a rocket. Edgar Allan Poe, as I mentioned in the first presentation, uh, was one of the many authors that delved into science fiction. And of course, Jules Verne, and H.G. Wells are what can be seen as the father of science fiction. Here is actually uh, a picture from this book here, uh, a true story, and you can see, if you will, some of the uh, presumed aliens. They kind of look like spiders to me, but I guess that was the limit of the imagination then. Now let's look at real rockets, because I know you're going to bring up the fact that, well, the first group was really apparently the Chinese in the 1200s, and they used small rockets in warfare. And the Mongolians grabbed a hold of this, and it continued through Poland and Spain and a whole bunch of countries uh, up into the Napoleonic Wars. And of course, in 1812, it was used against us uh, the rocket's red glare in Fort McHenry. Space travel in fiction. Uh, the first was probably really a trip to the moon, this 1902 um, movie, which was based on H.G. Wells' First Men in the Moon. And I'll show you pictures from this, but uh, their rocket was really a hollow artillery shell shot from a giant cannon. We now know that that wouldn't work. The G-forces, the gravitational forces, would be just too much. Fritz Lang, very famous director and producer in 1929, had this uh, movie, Women in the Moon, which had the first countdown and the first multi-stage rocket. So that concept has been around for almost 100 years. Now here is, if you will, a trip to the moon and you see it didn't do very well for the moon, but it did uh, shoot the moon in the eye. Um, the man in the moon, I guess, now is single-sided. Here is the uh, Fritz Lang movie poster, and you can see it looks like it's a bit more modern, uh, a missile, although this is a few years later. The history of space travel uh, planets in science fiction, before Galileo turned his, his telescope in 1609 to the planets, uh, the solar system was not widely recognized as worlds or places where a person could definitively set foot. Dante, though, describes the ascent of the narrator through the spheres of the moon, Mercury, Saturn, and thence to the fixed stars. So again, it's kind of interesting how some of these early authors uh, picked up some ideas from science and vice versa. If you wonder where everything that you have lost and can't find goes, 
it's not black hole, it's the moon, as Aristotle, how do you pronounce that? Aristotle suggested in 1513. Well, getting to the moon, uh, fiction is obviously fathered by two great men, H.G. Wells, who wrote about this space gun to shoot a bullet to the moon, uh, and also even before that, Jules Verne in 1865. Now, I will admit that these two weren't best friends, uh, but that's a story for another day. Here is H.G. Wells' Things to Come, and you can see the spacesuit is not quite as fancy as the ones that uh, Doug and Bob, the dads, wore yesterday on uh, Dragon Endeavor. And here is the cannon that shot the bullet, which you see here, which is a hollow spacecraft to the moon. All that was, of course, fiction. The idea of going to the moon in real life Hygens, who was a great physicist, uh, wrote this, Considering Life on Other Planets, in 1698. Campanella defended Galileo's feelings, and the most tar popular target of the 17th century was to the moon, uh, obviously, because it was what was seen the easiest. And it was quite some time before such extraordinary voyages went beyond the moon. Well, in 1877, two moons of Mars were reported with better telescopes. Schiaparelli, uh, who has something named uh, for him on Mars, found the surface of Mars adorned with continents, maybe seas, and channels suitable for life. And it was the great uh, telescope expert, Percival Lovell, uh, who described what he thought were canals created by Martians. What was a problem was it was a translation, if you will, a typo uh, from the word canali, uh, which didn't necessarily mean man-made, but was just a drainage of water if, in the past. Mars remi remained a favorite destination for fictional travelers down to the early 1960s, uh, the Red Planet. So the dream of stepping into the outer reaches of the Earth's atmosphere was driven by fiction of Jules Verne and H.G. Wells and rocket technology developed to realize this vision. So again, we're going from real to real, R-E-A-L to R-E-E-L and back again, an intertwining of science fiction and science, which have influenced each other and especially have influenced the people that go in to either. Now I have to say something about the pulp magazines that some of us grew up with, and uh, they were very popular in the uh, 30s, 40s, and 50s. And here is one, Astounding Stories that contain science fiction essays, if you will. Amazing stories, and look here, at the lower left, H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Edgar Allan Poe. Pretty good group of stories. And here is a third. There are about a half a dozen of these. I'm only showing three. And here is science fiction. This one is from uh, 1958. <coughs> well, if you look at real life, uh, there were three individuals, uh, one a Russian, Tolyovsky, one, a German Transylvanian, Oberth, and a third, which you probably have heard of, and is this man right here, Goddard. He, in the 1920s, 1928, uh, put forth and recognized the idea of rocketry. Uh, he was a professor at Clark's University in Worcester, Massachusetts, and really was the first designer of real rockets. And of course, we go from Goddard, of which multiple things are named after, to this individual, which you all recognize as Werner von Braun. He obviously worked for the Germans in World War II, helped develop the V2, which killed 4,000 individuals in London and Antwerp, as well as about 20,000 German slaves working on the V2. 
and he was brought over to the United States when he defected in 1945 in what was called Operation Paperclip. I guess my favorite quote of his is he was asked about that involvement with V2, and he said, the only problem with the rocket was it landed on the wrong planet. Space exploration in the U.S. really began because of the Cold War, the space race with USSR. And of course, everything changed on 10-4-57, October 4th, 1957, when that basketball-sized satellite that only beeped was sent up by the Russians. And depending who you read, it caused panic, at least in the newspapers, and uh, in Congress, uh, and probably caused some panic uh, in some of the population of the US. It looked like we were falling behind Russia. Russia was training two to three times the number of uh, scientists uh, that we were, and so everything changed, and education became a major issue with MIT and other great universities putting together real good books on math and science and so on. The first outer space flights to the moon, uh, 1959, the first artificial body to reach another celestial body was 1959. And if you fast forward up to now, there's been a total of six spacecraft with humans landing on the moon. And of course, the hot time was between 1969 and 1972. So if you add it up, uh, not counting Bob and Doug up there now, we have 24 people that have traveled on or around the moon, and 12 of those, by the way, have set foot on the moon, uh, not a TV uh, station, uh, if you will really on the moon. And they have brought back 842 pounds of moon rock. Uh, their last Apollo 17 included a geologist uh, who obviously couldn't be fooled and realize that these were truly uh, lunar rocks. Space exploration, and I have a number of slides that goes through everything, but this is a truncated slide. Started with the Cold War, the space race with Eric Gargarin Gargar Gargar in 1961, the soft landing on another celestial body, the first space station, the first moon landing uh, with Armstrong, and of course the present space shuttle uh, and the ISS is what's present now, the International Space Station. And of course yesterday you saw the combination of SpaceX with NASA. It's interesting to note that robiotics has played a major role. And of course, that's been a debate a little bit. Do we send up human beings that are at risk and very expensive to support them, or do we send up robots? And you can see here, if you look down the list, that, virtually, that actually every planet in our solar system has been flown by by these spacecraft. including Ceres and Pluto. It's important to tell you that the distances are massive, even within our solar system. Voyager 1 left Earth about in 1977, and it left finally our solar system uh, quite a few years later in 2012, um, and it was going about 25,000 miles per hour. Uh, so even if we wanted it to go um, more than it has now, 13 billion miles, it would have about 40,000 years to reach the closest star other than our sun. So the distances are major. Now, why are we interested in discovering a second sample of life? If life happened in a small area like our solar system, uh, and it has a different molecular context, a different molecular alphabet, rhetoric, grammar, and it's occurred twice independently within the confines of our own little solar system, then think about throughout the universe. So 
just one alien of different molecular structure uh, would suffice to establish what is called a cosmic imperative and that the universe uh, may be set up somehow to bring forth life and it's an integral part of the natural working of the life-friendly laws we can truly feel at home. Why do we have to go? Well, we have to go for a number of reasons. We're naturally curious, we wanna know. Uh, as some uh, people who climb uh, Mount Everest say, the reason they climb it is there. For our survival, there's a book that just came out this week on human migration and why humans and other animals have to migrate. Our freedom, our mythology, Joseph Campbell believes that, and for the future. So I think there's all kinds of internal and external reasons to go where no one has gone before. Joseph Campbell uh, of Sarah Lawrence uh, University feels that most myths uh, are monomyths and they're motifs of archetypal mythological narratives found in worldwide myths. And they are in which a hero ventures forth, encounters fabulous forces, somehow gets a decisive victory, and then returns with power. And if you go down this list here, you can see that the call to adventure, the departure, the ordeals, the return is very similar to Homer's Ulysses, Odyssey, uh, and really an awful lot of the fiction uh, and nonfiction that we read. One of the major things that uh, Apollo has brought back with us is the picture of the pale blue marble. And hopefully that has encouraged environmentalists to protect our own little spaceship, Earth. If you want a single book on the case for space, this is a good one by Robert Zubrin, C-U-B-R-I-N. So the idea of worlds inhabited by intelligent beings is old thinking by the Greeks, as you see here, uh, by this Greek, the Syrian, uh, and as well as Voltaire, uh, who uh, used it uh, mostly, as you can imagine, it sounds like him, to comment on the foibles and the follies of humans. Our encounters with aliens, aliens is a really interesting word. It come, means alienation or feeling like an outsider. And as I said before in the introductory presentation, uh, really science fiction is representative of some of our anxieties that we project upon the screen of our anxieties and fears, whether it's invasion or contamination or immigration, racist, prejudice, fear, cold war, communism, and so on. So there is this intercalation, if you will, into science fiction by some of our projections and some of our problems. The problem with traveling to other worlds is distance, which we'll come back to. Obviously, space is littered with all kinds of things, including high energy particles. Contamination, either us contaminating other areas or them contaminating us if they visit us. We would have to bring our own food and ecosystems, at least initially. And if we ran into something that was definitely radically different, uh, with molecular machinery, uh, then we might have a problem in communication and so on. And of course, there's always fear of the unknown. Medical problems with space travel, the distances are unimaginable and the energies to get there are unimaginable. So it's gonna take a very long time. And maybe one of the major, if not the major problem, is the psychology of it all. You can't storm outside your house and slam the door in outer space. Space is very unforgiving. And we now know that there's bone and muscle loss, even if you exercise. There's balance problems, sleep problems, eye, heart, brain, communication, high energy particles. There's junk out there, immune problems, decompression, G-forces, and what we haven't even thought of yet. 
And we can talk more about this if we have time for questions and answers. Well, if we go to Mars, uh, we need to think about terraforming uh, as uh, the Martian did uh, uh, in the movie. Uh, but what was interesting is, as usual, terraforming was first mentioned not in the scientific journal, but in science fiction. So again, there's been this interplay between real and real, between science and science fiction. Uh, the original scientific term, by the way, was exosynthesis. So you can see that science fiction folks are a lot better at naming things than scientists. Here's Biosphere 2, uh, which was a University of Arizona State University uh, initiative where they decided to put all these people in place, uh, isolated for two years. Uh, it worked not real well, it was taken over by University of Arizona, and to make a long story short, one couple got married and several others wouldn't talk to each other at the end of the experiment. So the psychology of living together for a long time is really tough. Luckily, up there now, uh, if you will, Bob and Doug are best friends, as you've heard. How bright and beautiful a comet is as it flies past our planet, provided it does fly by, according to Asimov. Another way of saying it is you have killer asteroids everywhere, and it's nature's way of asking, how's that space program coming along? Because as I said in my first slide, we got to get out of here if it's the last thing we ever do, and I'm going to show you why. I think you already know. All civilizations, according to Carl Sagan, become either spacefaring or extinct. The universe out there, the solar system out there, the galaxies out there are shooting galleries. They're pinball machines. There's all kinds of matter going every which way. Here is a picture of the known asteroid impact craters all scattered all over the Earth. And of course, the biggest one is the one that presumably killed the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. But there are a number of others, and the size of the circle depicts the energy of the impact, which is major, and I'll come to that in a second. Here are the uh, asteroid impacts that are not ancient history. This is just between 1994 and 2013. And you can see that there is no bias or prejudice here. Everybody. Uh, gets hit. If you look at the destructive force of asteroid impacts, it's really quite amazing. Uh, and you can see that we're talking about kilotons, what is comparable to atom bombs and hydrogen bombs. And of course, the bigger the asteroid, the more explosive the yield, but the decrease in frequency, although some occur fairly frequently. If you look at this 20 meter meteor, it exploded 12 miles above Russia in 2013. Now, 20 meters is not very big. It'll fit inside of a, a football field, obviously. It had 30 times the power of the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. The shock wave spread out and damaged thousands of buildings, but somehow no one was killed. So because of the velocity and momentum of these meteors, even if small, if they hit the ground or atmosphere and they're too big to go through to get burned up by the atmosphere, then they're gonna cause major explosions. And here are the asteroid tra trajectories, and you can see that the Earth, if you were here, is in the line of fire of known asteroids. Now, in about 1995 to 97, uh, Congress set up a watch group, and it involved initially uh, JPL uh, and Caltech, and they recorded about 15,000 near-Earth objects. That means within 1.3 astronomical units, uh, an astronomical unit is 63 million miles. That is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. 
So we've identified 95% of the very, very large asteroids, including like those that kill the dinosaurs, 90% of medium-sized asteroids. But the small ones that can also do tremendous damage if they hit a city are largely unknown. And of course, it's not just recording them, but moving them so they don't encounter Earth. New chapter, if you will, will be a breakthrough star shot. Yuri Milner and Stephen Hawking announced in 2016 an initiative to develop high-speed nanocrafts or nanoprobes to send them to the nearest star system outside of our own sun where they could relay, relay all kinds of information. So how do you build a starship? The stars are very, very far away, as I've said. The easiest probably one that we'll use first will be nanoships. They're small, they require a small amount of energy, and we can send hundreds of thousands out throughout the universe eventually. I will go over and show you sails and starships and fusion and fission rockets and antimatter starships, and you can go through this and see that we may be even able to apparently go faster than the speed of light or through wormholes or change the nature of space itself. So if you look at this picture, you will see the size of the Statue of Liberty right here. There's the uh, older Apollo space shuttles, uh, the heavy Falcon rocket, uh, Saturn V, which has put most of the people that the US have had uh, into outer space and bigger and bigger rockets that'll hold more and more. Some rockets are very, very large, and getting all of this material and machinery out into outer space is going to be a problem, but I'll show you one of the ideas that individuals have about that. Well, here is SpaceX, the Falcon Heavy rocket uh, going up, and it's not like the one that I showed you at the beginning, but uh, SpaceX is really an amazing group of people. What is also really amazing, and one of the reasons for their success, is they can actually land in retrograde, if you will, the first stage rocket and use it up to 10 times. So this renewable rocket saves an immense amount of money. And let me show that to you. If you do an expendable Falcon 9 here, which means it falls into the ocean and dies, it's about $6,000 per kilogram. But if you reuse it, it goes to about $200 per milligram uh, that, I'm sorry, per kilogram uh, to take up into outer space. So it saves a lot of money. And that's one of the four or five reasons SpaceX is doing so well. Once SpaceX implements its plan to refuel upper stages in orbit and eventually on other planets, then they will be able to go to Mars and beyond. The propulsion for space vehicles is primarily chemical, breaking chemical bonds, combustion, in which you have liquid oxygen and high-grade kerosene that come together and by Newton's third law, um, for a reaction, there is an opposite and equal reaction, propels the rocket into space. There are other propulsions, if you will, and I'm really not gonna go through all of those. Here's laser fusion, which has been partly demonstrated. Some people have suggested that sails can be propelled by uh, solar uh, energy particles, or solar waves. And here you see an artist's conception of a solar spacecraft approaching Venus. There is such a thing as an idea of a space elevator in which you have tethered to the ground of Earth one part, and then the upper part is uh, attached to a satellite which has a counter lever above it, and it's one way to get into space and to move heavy machinery, as you see here in uh, this uh, cartoon, if you will, of a uh, space elevator. Another way to get into space is, as you know, uh, is a slingshot effect, the gravitational slingshot. 
uh, the gravitational uh, maneuver in which you can use uh, an orbiting planet uh, to slingshot you further and faster. Well, here's the idea of SpaceX's vision for colonizing Mars, and it's going to be using a BFR, uh, which stands for Big F Rocket. Uh, there's a little bit of debate of what that F stands for, but we won't go there. Speed, NASA's newest horizon rocket to Pluto can go about 100,000 miles per hour. That seems to be as fast as we can go. Uh, uh, in solar probes, we can go four times that maybe, but that's still only a tenth of 1% of the speed of light. So we have a ways to go to go near the speed of light. As I said before, our closest star is Alpha Centauri, which is 4.3 light years away. I'd remind you a light year is 6 trillion miles. So if we're talking about 4.3 light years away, we're not talking about 100,000 miles, four times around the Earth. We're not talking about 10 times that, a million miles. We're not talking about 10 times that, a billion miles, but we're talking about 24 times that. So I think you can see we're talking about incredible distances. The best fuel, obviously, is not inefficient coal or inefficient gasoline. Fission is pretty good, like uranium, although we really can't send that up into outer space because of international law. Fusion, like the sun, getting hydrogen into helium is fairly efficient, but really not very perfect. The best is matter antimatter. The problem is uh, we can't create very much of that at all. But if you could create a fission or a fusion bomb back here and you have good insulation, uh, realize that people are here pretty close, then that could power a spaceship further and faster, especially if it was nuclear fission or fusion. Another idea is to use what the universe provides and that is have a collector that collects the hydrogen and eventually creates it, moves it into helium, and an immense amount of energy uh, called nuclear fusion. A most interesting idea by a guy named uh, Al Cuberi, a Mexican cosmologist, was that you can actually apparently move through space by contracting the space in front of you, which apparently allows you to move forward, and expanding the space behind you. So you really move kind of forward through space, not because you're moving forward through space, but because you're decreasing the distance between the front of your ship and your, uh, where you're going and increasing the amount of space behind. Well, space is unforgiving. And we may, and this will be the topic of the next and last uh, presentation, we may need to have genetic engineering to survive space with less oxygen needs, uh, the effects of gravity, less mutations, uh, adaptable changes in temperatures, psychologically fit, decreased need for certain foods like chocolate or urban. Uh, and that will be the subject of uh, next week's final talk. So ships to other planets may be multi-generational, which means they're gonna to have to be pretty big. We may put people in suspended animation, but the problem there is ice crystals. When you uh, freeze something, the ice crystals are very jagged and like uh, swords and will destroy the cells and the organs. Well, maybe we can create transhumans or send just the clones or the embryos the DNA codes, the person's entire brain, or again, these small, less energy requiring, self-replicating nanobots. So the extreme distances are a concern. As I said before, it will take us 80,000 years presently to reach Alpha Centauri, our closest star that has an exoplanet. So in essence, beings and worlds 
are like we are right now, quarantined from one another. I don't know if that was some entity's great idea or that's just the way it happened. So for all practical purposes, we're alone. The reason being the speed of light is very slow in terms of cosmological distances. The universe is continuing to expand, thank you very much, due to dark energy, cosmological constant, and uh, even communication takes a long time. So we really are quarantined on this planet for a while, for all practical purposes. If we run into ET, we really don't have any definite declaration of principles concerning meeting ET or anything that has teeth. So that is an issue every country may do things on their own. So the last question is, does all life, intelligent or otherwise, have to be organic? We're studying the set heavens the celestial uh, cover uh, for biosignatures that are related to water or life as we know it on this planet, but there may be life as we don't know it, uh, non-organic forms, silicon or something else we haven't even imagined on other planets. Maybe we'll create our own aliens and be others aliens. Maybe we will populate, we will survive enough of our foibles to populate other planets and other solar systems and maybe even other galaxies eventually. But what we would want to do is make a machine, a nanobot, a celestial robot that would be proud of us uh, and not try to take us out. So I'm going to end with the X-File and see if you have any questions about past, present, or future space flight. Gina, all yours. I haven't seen any questions come up in the chat, uh, just thank yous. And um, I don't want to ask any questions because it'll look like I'm leading you to the next slides, but I do have questions. Okay. So, <laughs> you said, um, that you would explain why it is we have to get off this rock. Yeah, uh, multiple reasons, but the number one reason is all of those killer asteroids and comets. And those are just matter left over from the formation of stars and planets. Now, I need to say something, you know, in science fiction movies, we see, for example, in Star Wars, uh, Han Solo uh, operating his Millennial Falcon, and he's dodging all of these asteroids. Well, that's not true, is the asteroids are very, very, very far, far separated from each other. I mean, that's why we call it space. There's a lot of space. And so despite that, as you saw, uh, we have been hit before and the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, and we're probably due in the future to some hit, get being hit by asteroids, uh, which wiped out the dinosaurs primarily, but you know might be able to do the same thing to us. So one of the major reasons is if you don't put all your chickens in one basket, then you have less likely chance of being wiped out in one place or time. I guess another example of that, and this is maybe not as good analogy, but in 1850, the Irish potato famine. The reason that fungus did such havoc on the Irish potatoes is that they were all the same. They had the same genes, they had no natural resistance, there was no hybrid vigor. And so, you know, maybe as we travel to other planets, we will also speciate and uh, maintain some semblance of Homo sapiens, sapiens. The other reasons to get off our planet are, uh, and Diamond has written a book on this called Collapse, is that we may use up our own resources. Or of course, if uh, climate change and global warming uh, continues to occur, then we could become like Venus, uh, which is extraordinarily hot because of the greenhouse effect. Um, so I think there's lots of reasons 
to get started. Uh, obviously, uh, one journey starts with one step. Um, but I think yesterday we saw the reinstitution of a step. Gina, other comments or questions? Thank you. Um, Janet said that SpaceX is a private company, not publicly traded. I don't know if you can see that in the comments. Uh, no, I don't have that up. That is absolutely right. Elon Musk uh, formed that in 2002. He initially went to Russia to buy some rockets. They were too expensive. So he said, darn it, I'll do it on my own. And SpaceX now has sent up 20 cargoes to the ISS, the International Space Ship, uh, Station. He's uh, had over 100 rocket launches. There are at least 18, and I can tell you what those are if you want, of firsts that SpaceX has done. Now, I need to tell you in the spirit of disclosure, I unfortunately have no stock in SpaceX. So this is all known stuff. The reason his group, uh, which is comprised of 7,000 dedicated individuals, SpaceX is, well, before yesterday, it was worth $33 billion, is uh, worth a lot more now. Uh, is they have a vertical, a vertical integrated uh, financial system. They do all of their manufacturing in-house. They don't have to uh, go outside for anything. They have reusable rockets, which as you've seen, saves lots of money. Um, they hire really great people. They have in essence, in a way, saved the East Coast of uh, Florida. Uh, and they have a number of other issues. Uh, for example, uh, previously NASA would pay some group that created a rocket an X amount of money and then profit. Well, with SpaceX, you have certain milestones that you reach and get a certain amount of money for this milestone and a certain amount for this. And uh, the fact that it's a private entity allows it to do all kinds of things that a national entity like NASA may just not be able to do because its hands are tied because of government. So I think what's really interesting about SpaceX uh, and NASA is how they've come together in this public uh, private uh, enterprise. It's really a way to the future. I don't know Janet if that was... gave a big wow during your answer. So I, I think I there were some things there she hadn't considered and uh, was blown away by. Well, let me ask if, if there's any to, other questions or comments about SpaceX. If anybody wants to unmute yourself, your microphone may be in the bottom left corner if you're on a computer and you can feel free to ask Fred your question. I think I see Elvon Lloyd maybe has a question, maybe looking for a microphone. No? Okay. Just double checking. Uh, Janet has a question. Further back, you mentioned a book, but I can't remember who by it, regarding survival. Uh, I might have to go back and relook. Oh, the, the Martian by Weir. That's uh, actually, is that the book? I thought you said there was survival in the title, but. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I'm going to go back to that book. Everybody close your eyes for a minute. Oh. Uh, Let me go back to that book. This book. Oops. No, not the case for space. I made a note of that. It was prior to that. That's okay. I'll uh, look at the uh, program again in the front end and maybe next week ask you who the author was. Or okay. I okay. think the book that you might want to get is The Martian. Okay. By Weir, W-E-I-R, uh, because it's also required reading for astronauts. Now, it's fiction. As you know, Matt Damon. Uh, oh. Wildly. Um, uh, and, uh, it's pretty realistic. It's good science. And, uh, it's probably the closest book to what it would be like at this stage, no pun intended, to go to, uh, Mars. Uh, and the movie is also really, really terrific. So if you get a chance, The Martian with Matt Damon. Thanks, okay. Janet. I don't see any raised hands on the icons or any questions in that. So uh, 
Fred, I thank you for this class. It's been enlightening. It's very timely considering the lunch this weekend. And we uh, planned that well, didn't we? You did an awesome job. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of claps in the pictures from people and they're leaving class now. So thank you very much. And we'll see you one more time next week. You bet. Thank Bye. you much, Gina. Thank Bye -bye, you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.